Definitely FTP, yeah. transferring files, accessing things. Email was a thing before the web, right? But it, the internet was really confined to kind of academic institutions and maybe some, you know, cutting edge uh, technology companies. Uh, but really it was still in this kind of realm of not very popular. Like not many people knew kind of what the internet was. And so this was the very first web page. This is the World Wide Web, and it's you know pretty interesting. There's links to like what's out there, um, and so it's pretty crazy when you think about it. Is this piece of software, these protocols that Tim Berners Lee created at CERN, ended up becoming this insane monstrosity that we all use everywhere, and actually, we'll see, really spurned the development of the internet and the web, and made it become this huge phenomenon. Um, so. You know, it's, this is not too different than what we think of as a web page, right? We have text on the page. What are the, what's this blue thing with the underlining here? It has a link. What does it mean, though? Maybe you want to, doesn't have to be perfect, yeah. Yeah, it's like a, kind of like a pointer, right? You think about pointers. So this, a pointer points to some memory location that has the actual data you want. A link is some text that points to a document with hopefully describes more information about whatever this link is. And so he, um, so he created a proposal at CERN to say, hey, I want some time to create this thing. And there had already been some of these ideas of hypertext, but they kind of been locked up in academic prototypes. That's an interesting research area if you want to look at it. Um, he wrote a book. I highly recommend this book if you're interested in the web. Uh, weaving the web, this describes kind of what his thought process was, what everything that was going on in the creation of the web. Uh, so the idea was, it was kind of this nice answer, we had this idea of hypertext, right? These links to other documents, along with the connection of the internet, which now meant you had a intercon, right? Rather than just an intranet, right? Now, instead of just talking, your computer talking to machines on your local network, your computer can now talk to nodes across the net in other places geographically, right? The whole idea of the internet. And we had the TCP IP <laughs> stack, so we had reliable ways of communicating. And the idea kind of grew from this, hey, I want something to manage CERN documents, to this universal worldwide system of documents where anybody could create a node and have documents on it, and you could have a link to either documents on those people's pages or documents to somebody else's page in a completely different server in a different part. Um, and this is where we then get the idea of the web. But there's three key problems and questions you need to answer about how to do this. So what are they? So you're Tim Berners-Lee, you've been teleported to, let's say, 89 is one of beat him to design the web. What are the questions you need to answer? Yeah. How do I distinguish the format? Which format? For um, whatever this page is. Mm. Yeah, so there's a question of, okay, you have a document, right, which is text. How do you know what parts of that document are the text and what parts are the hypertext, which are links to other parts of the document, right? You can think of, there's actually a lot of different ways you could do that. You could send maybe an index that says, okay, characters 0 through 5 is a link to this, and characters 10 through 20 are a link to this and then just send the text in a completely different uh, string. So you have the question of how do you communicate links, right? So a document, how do you do the hypertext part? Is that it? All that, you're done? How secure is it? How secure is that? Absolutely not. That's not an essential question. <laughs> I know I wish it was, but we'll see. The path of the web takes the path of many technologies like IP and TCP, where you first develop it and see if you can, and see if it works, and then you go, Oh, security, right. <laughs> what else? Yeah. How do you transmit it? Tra how do you transmit it? So how do you get that data from that remote system, right? The protocols we have are TCP and IP. Do they say, how do I fetch hypertext from a remote server? No, so you need to develop some protocol to do that. As a key third component, and it may be weird to think about because we're so used to this whole idea of the web, right? 
Where do you start? Uh, where do you start? Or if you get a link, a similar question, how do you know where to go? Right? Of the entire universe, think about the entire space of all computers that are on the internet. How do I know which one has the information that I want? And then how do I ask for it? And then when I get that response back, how do I know which parts are text and which parts are hypertext? So these are the three key questions. And as we'll see, this is important because the three core web technologies all come down from answering these questions. So how do we name a resource? So how can you know that the, my web page is on some server with an IP address that I don't even know, and that your specific class is in a certain location on that server? So how do you even name that, right? And this has to be a universal thing, so that when I say a name, it's not from my perspective. And I say, oh yeah, you go, you know, it has to be a universal thing. This is actually a thing in, uh, can I mention early email addresses had the exclamation point character in them that would route. So you would have username <coughs> at, and then you'd have the next server bang, the next server bang, the next server bang, and finally where the person was. And that was the route of how your email had to get from you to the other person. Right? That's not a global name, because that's going to be different for everyone. So we need global, unique names of how to name a resource. How do we request and serve a resource? Right? So once I know who has it, how do I ask for it? And the third one is, well, how do I create that? How do I interpret that document so I can get new links? And as we'll see, naming is all defined by URIs, Uniform Resource Identifier, which again is one of these things that's so kind of core. We see links, we see HTTP colon slash slash all the time. Um, HTTP, Hypertext Transform Protocol, that is the answer to the question of how do we request and serve. And HTML, the Hypertext Markup Language, is how we describe a document that contains hypertext. And they're super cool. So they actually form this nice kind of loop. So you first, I mean, this is actually the question, right? How do you start? HTML. You start with HTML? Where did that HTML come from? <coughs> oh, in terms of creating. OK, I thought creating. Oh, I think, no, not necessarily creating, but using, let's say. Yeah, you need, well, you need a URI. You need not only a domain, you need to know where to go, right? You need some kind of URL for URI. I'm going to use them interchangeably because they're essentially the same thing. You think of URI as a more general term of a URL, but uh, for our purposes, they're basically the same. So you have a URI, which then tells your client, your browser, which doesn't necessarily have to be a browser, so I'm going to try to use the word client, tells your client, how do I make an HTTP request to that server to access that resource. Then after you make that HTTP request, you get an HTTP response back. And that is HTML. And on that page, what's on the H on that HTML page? More links, more URIs, which then our, our client can know how to fetch. And it's just this beautiful, beautiful cycle. So these are all three super interrelated technologies. And this is why we're actually going to spend I mean, pretty much the majority of the time looking at these three protocols. So we're going to start with the beginning of the circle, right? URIs. Um, I guess you can think of this as a spiral. And maybe if you've ever found yourself like three or four levels deep in Wikipedia reading about some crazy French king that you never learned about before, uh, you'll probably understand that it maybe is a spiral. But uh, you know, technology-wise, it's a big old circle. And even this is, I mean, this is still true nowadays. This is not like from the beginning of the web. Even when you throw things like JavaScript and all these fancy things, it all boils down to these three technologies. So URIs are essential, basically metadata. So how do I know who to talk to? And how do I ask them for a resource? So how do I know they can give me a page about cooking instead of a page about programming? Right? They're a server, they have a bunch of resources. So it needs to answer the which server has it. Who do I talk to? Right? And this could be domain name, which we know is translated through DNS to an IP address. Right? So who has it? Hi, I'm John. Hi, John. 
how do I ask? Right? So the question is, how do I ask for that resource? And this is actually a nice thing that they added here. Rather than make URI specific to HTTP, you, this is the universal part, is you can have HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, uh, email links, all kinds of different types of links. And how can the server locate the resource? So how can the server know what resource I actually want? Right? Main questions here. And again, and this is why all the way back, it's hard to remember, you have to remember paying homework three, all the way back to like homework one when you're writing an HTTP client or server, right? Is all of this stuff is all defined in publicly available documents that you can go read exactly what it means to be for a URI, what all the parts mean. So the basic syntax, you have some scheme. So this would be HTTP, HTTPS, a colon, and then some authority. So the authority is who has it, some path, a question mark, a query part, a hash, and then a fragment. So it's pretty, and this is straightforward. This encompasses every URI you've ever seen. Ever. It doesn't follow this. You can even have telephone numbers on here. So I believe it's T E L colon and then the number. And if you put that, a link with that on your phone, it will actually, when you click on that link, it'll open up the phone app to try to call them. It'll say, Do you want to call this number? Is that what Telnet is? No. Telnet is, uh, I understand the, the yeah. discrepancy there. Telnet is SSH, but unencrypted. So that's why it's a close port. I can't remember. I think it's 23 and tell them it's 22 or something like that. I can't remember if that's correct. But So scheme is the protocol. The authority, it basically means who can interpret this. And this is actually an important point because even though we're used to maybe a link that looks like HTTP colon slash slash google.com slash search, which to us as humans means uh, this must be the search page of Google. To us, what we think this means doesn't matter. The slash search, whatever the path and query is, is up to the authority, whoever that server is, to understand what that means. So links don't need to be human readable. They are for marketing purposes, and it's easy to send them to people and all that nice stuff. Um, and so that, of course, the authority has its own syntax, where you can have a username at some host, and then usually a colon, and then a port. And you can even, I think, in here, in some things, add a password in there for username password to add this certain host. So every scheme has a default port, right? Why does every scheme need a default port? You don't have to so they can differentiate each other. Yeah, because the server, right? We learned when we learned about IP and TCP, it has to listen on a certain port. And there's only one application that can listen to a port on a server, and so HTTP is port 80, so by default. Um, a server can change that and host a web server on any port, but then it has to, the authority would have to be this different port, so you'd know which port to go to. So the path is usually a hierarchical structure separated by slashes, just like a directory listing. The query is super interesting, so it's used to pass, as we'll see, non-hierarchical data. And the fragment, so what is, has, have you seen URLs which have stuff after the hash? What is, like, why? The buffer should be. Yeah, so if you go to it in a browser, usually when you do that, it will direct you down to some part of the page that's not necessarily at the top of the page. The idea is, it goes back to documents and resources, right? So your, the link, the URI is to a document. And the fragment is the sub-object of that document. So this is why you can say, I want to link you to this page, but specifically this part. And it's up to the, so the, actually the super interesting thing about this is that the fragment does not get sent to the server. Because the server doesn't care about the fragment at all. The server only cares about the path and the query. And then it's up to the client or the user agent to figure out what part of the sub-resource that is. Questions on URI syntax. So how do you include a path with a question mark in it? 
Can you? Would you want to? Can you, can you have a question mark in your hat? No. Why not? Because then there is, uh, a thing that is passing the URL, they will know that it will feel like that will start a query. Yeah, what if I want to make a web page that has a URI or will you pass my class question mark? Mm -hmm. What's my page? Yeah, that's yeah, so we need some kind of encoding, right? We've seen this before in a lot of different protocols. So you can see, even just in this URL, colons, question marks, uh, the hash, right? All, and sla even slashes, all of these can change the meaning. Uh, and so we need some type of encoding, which we'll see in a second. Um, so some examples, right? So going over, so what's the scheme of this? Who, the authority? Not example.com. What is the authority? That's example.com colon 8042. Right? So that whole thing's the authority. So you have scheme and then slash slash example.com colon 8042, but the slash slash is kind of not super important. Uh, and then we have the path slash over there, and the query is test equals bar, and then the fragment is those. So this is a, I'm not going to go through all these because. That would be crazy. Um, you can see all these different examples. But let's go through the exact last example. So the scheme is HTTPS. The authority is slash slash example.com. And then what's the path? Or what is the authority? Is the authority example.com slash test slash example? Colon one, which would be port one. What's the problem? Yeah. Exactly. The prop. I mean, there's a problem parsing this, right? It's not. You probably have to look very closely at the rules, right, to see what the precedence was. This would be back to those of you who take a 340, right? For how exactly this parsing would work and how each of the things would be. Um, and part of the problem is: is slash Adam part of the query or is the uh, question mark part of the first be part of the path. And then what about this colon here? So that's when we get to the idea of, to make this very clear, right, we need some kind of encoding mechanism. So of course, instead of using an encoding mechanism that already exists, like, I don't know, uh, but some, what are some that we've looked at? Like in, let's say, a Python string, you can do like slash x20 or the x value. Of course, you have to come up with a new one. And so there's a list of reserved characters. So these are characters that mean something in the URI itself. Um, and then, I just don't know if it's if Tim Berners Lee. Oh, I should say he's, uh, he was, he's a UK citizen, and he was knighted. So he's now Sir Tim Berners Lee, which is pretty cool. So if you invent something that becomes as important as the web, maybe you'll get knighted. And you're a citizen. Yeah, yeah, maybe. You can maybe defect or I don't know, get a new citizenship or whatever. But you know, that could be in your future. So in percent encoding, the idea is it's actually pretty simple. Um, you have to encode anything that's not alphanumeric, a digit, a dash, dot, underscore, and tilde. So did I make all this up? Where did I get this from? RFC. Yeah, this is all from the RFC. It's all in there. And so you encode each byte that's not well, in that. You do percent and then the hexadecimal of that ASCII value of that character. So it's pretty simple. So the ampersand is one of the reserved characters. We would need to put percent 26 because the ASCII, uh, the ASCII value of the ampersand character in hexadecimal is 26. Percent, so similarly to a lot of things, if we have slash, that's our character, we encode slashes as slash slash. And so similarly here, the percent sign is now a special character because it's part of how we used to encode things. So what would this be? Percent percent? Yeah, percent 25 or whatever the hex value is. 
right? Space is percent 20, which is probably familiar because you've seen that before, and so on and so forth. So now we can fix this. So now if I gave you this example, now how would this parse? So now what's the path here? Test example all the way up to colon one period HTML and then to the question mark and then finally everything after that question mark is part of the query is slash matter. So it's incumbent, so uh, it's incumbent on the web server, right, the server that's reading this to then parse that out into the individual parts, right? But it's the job of example.com to do that. We don't do that. Everything else is essentially opaque to us. Everything after that. Cool. Questions on URI percent encoding? Sweet. All right. Another thing that we need to talk about is absolute versus relative URIs. So the idea is when we have links, we can specify exactly here is a link. Here is the scheme protocol, uh, the scheme, the authority, the what's everything else I want? The path and the query. Here's how you get your resource. Sometimes, though, we want to specify a link, maybe in our the current directory that we're in. Um, so the idea is there's many different types of doing this relative. So when you're looking at HTML source, you can see these differences, and it's always a very good idea, especially when you're learning the web, to when you're browsing the web, right click and say view source uh, or inspect element, or sometimes it's in some drop down menu somewhere. So this means, so the slash slash here means use the same scheme. So whatever this link is on, if the link is on a page that's an HTTP colon slash slash, this link will use HTTP. If it's on an HTTPS page, it will use HTTPS. But it still specifies the host and the path. Why is that useful? Yeah, so this way, if the page we're on is using HTTPS, then all the links will continue to use HTTPS, which we'll see is important when you're using images or bringing in other content into your page. But you may want to, not everyone can always use HTTPS, so with HTTP, your page will still not break and everything will still actually work good time. And the reverse can get you errors if you're using, if you're including things on your page from an unencrypted connection from HTTP that will cause warnings because then the whole thing is not encrypted. So we can do slash test slash help.html. So what would this be relative to? Yeah, example.com. So it still used the same scheme, the same authority. It's just the new path is test help.html. And we can even use directory traversal type things. So we can say go up two levels. So this would be, um, in this case, the context is always important. So in order to resolve a relative link, you need to know what page you're on. Cool. All right. So this is actually all we need about URIs. They're actually fairly, you know, uh, I'm sure you could spend, somebody could spend a long time talking about them, but they're pretty straightforward. Which brings us to HTTP, so the Hypertext Transport Protocol. Right, let's see, what, what, is it, what is it used for? Transporting hypertext, right? So it's after we have a URI that has a scheme of HTTP, we know what authority to talk to, we, we know exactly what, ho what host and on what port to make a TCP connection to them. Assuming that there's a server listening there, we'll think that they speak the HTTP protocol and we'll make our request over TCP. And you actually already know a lot about how this works, right? So this should be review. Yeah? Does anyone want to read the RFC again? I can go. <laughs> no? Yeah, but now we're doing it from the other way, right? From the client's perspective, not just the server. So. Uh, so the history is pretty interesting, so uh, I think I should update this. I think version 2 is probably close to being standardized, but uh, version 1 was defined in May of 1996, which is pretty interesting, so you think that the Timber and Lee created the first version in like 1990, 1991, and by 96 they standardized the first version of HTTP, 
uh, very uh, pretty soon after. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, fairly soon afterwards, they did version 1.1 1 .1 in 1999, and the new version, version two, is based on a Google proposal called SPDY, which has a lot of interesting features. I believe it uses encryption by default. It is a binary protocol, not a text-based protocol, as we'll see. Um, so, and it has a lot of like channels and multiplexing and making multiple requests in one thing. Um, and it's supposed to be a lot faster too, is the nice thing, so, or in some aspects. Um, so the overview is, right? So we actually could talk about this even without HTTP in particular because we've written servers, right? The server must be listening for incoming TCP connections on that port. Otherwise, you're not going to have a good time. That was, that happened one time on my website. I still don't know why, but apparently Apache crashed. And some people were emailing me that the website was down. And I went, I was like, that is weird. Why would the website crash? Like, I don't know. If somebody was doing something, they should tell me how they made that happen, because I was pretty, it shouldn't happen. But anyways. So you need a server listening for TCP connections, then the client, when it wants to connect, opens a TCP connection to the server. And now at this point, what should your mind be thinking about? What are the packets that are getting sent from the client to the server? <coughs> yeah, the handshake, right? What is the handshake? The SIN. The SIN and the app, right? This is part of you know, but now we're operating at a more higher level, right? We're taking that stuff for granted, but you do know exactly how that works, so you can explain everything here. Then the client sends the HTTP request, right? So once the TCP handshake is established, then the client sends its HTTP request in the protocol that we'll talk about. The server then reads that request, parses it, if it can understand that request, and it knows the path and the query that the server is talking about, it will generate an HTTP response potentially or probably containing the HTML content that the uh, client was asking for. Cool, so it's actually client, HTTP request, server, HTTP response. Cool. Uh, but really, it's actually, it can be a lot more complicated and it's interesting if you even read, if you read the, I think even the, yeah, the HTTP 1.1 spec that you read has references to firewalls and proxies, and there's a lot of options that can be set to try to control the behavior of these middle boxes. Um, so, and the proxy has some kind of cache, and the client has a cache, and so the client actually, and this is actually probably more similar to kind of ASU's network, right, which we've had problems with during some CTFs of them blocking our traffic, but the client makes the connection through a firewall, which goes through a proxy, which ends up going to the server, and that data comes back, and so you can have things like the client, when it asks for a resource, it looks at its local cache and it can actually serve up the HTTP response and the HTML content from its local cache. If it doesn't have that, maybe this proxy has already cached the content, so it sends it back. So there's a lot of interesting ways for these, this to happen. So, so this is more realistic, but we don't really need to think about it on this level. The more basic scenario is just fine at an abstract level. But this is part of and actually, I, mean, I think it's good to talk about now. Um, this is part of what makes the web, to me, so interesting and also very difficult because there's so many different technologies in play here. So not only do you have IP, TCP, we just talked about URIs and HTTP, now you're adding caches, firewalls, proxies into the mix, and any one of these could mess things up along the way. Um, so the web is a big ball of different technologies all working together, which is cool and crazy. So HTTP requests, these are things that you've parsed. It has a method, so we'll talk about what exactly a method is. It has a resource, which is derived from the URI. Again, that's that link between URIs and HTTP requests. Uh, the protocol version, why is it important to put the protocol version in a request? Yeah. So that's how it goes. Yeah, so the server knows if it can parse it or not. If, if it gets an HTTP 2.0 request, but it doesn't support that, it'll have to just drop the connection or tell the client to go away or something, right? Or the reverse, if the client sends an HTTP 1.0 request, 
the server, if it supports that, can drop down to that and speak that other protocol language. So this is why we even saw this in IP, right? Every IP packet has a version number on it, which is how we're able to upgrade from IPv4 to IPv6 because there's this information at each layer. Information about the client, which is optional, so this is something that the user, uh, the user agent can send in order to tell the server a little bit about itself. Uh, an optional body, which is how we'll upload content. And that's it, so it's pretty simple. So the syntax, yes. What about the headers? Ah, so this is a oh, high level request. overview of the things that are in the request. Yes, not the syntax, which we'll go over next, of exactly what they are. So at an overall thing, this is really when we start reading the spec and start breaking it down, this is really what an HTTP request is, right? We have a start line, followed by headers, followed by a body. Okay, it's just syntax stuff that we can parse. Every line is separated by CRLF, which some of you hopefully learned while doing the thing that new lines aren't sufficient, although most servers will support that anyways. Um, there's a lot of best effort parsing going on, but according to the spec, it has to be CRLFs. And then, so the there's a start line, a CRLF, and then you have a um, you have a list of headers. The question is how so. You separate the headers from the body with a blank, essentially a blank line. So you have the headers, you have as many headers as you want, and the question is how does the server know when the headers are ending and the body is beginning? Because there'll be a blank CRLF. And then you're good, and then you have the body. Questions? I'm trying to go through this quick so we can get to some, because we have to build up some base knowledge here, and then we'll start attacking stuff, which will be fun. So, Methods. So why do we have these different concepts of gets and posts and heads and deletes and puts? server or whatever the server puts so the or whatever the server supports so you can write a thing that has custom uh, methods that do random things that are non-standard so uh, so get is basically give me what you got um, post means I'm actually going to send some data to you uh, put means you should store whatever I'm going to give you under this this path, the URI, the path and the query parameters. And head is pretty interesting. It's identical to a get request, except the server doesn't send the body. Why would you include this if you're writing the HTTP <coughs> spec? Yeah? Testing to make sure that the page actually exists, maybe? It could be testing to make sure that the page exists before you fetch the whole thing. What else? Yeah, so it actually, um, so testing what the server supports, there's also going back to that diagram of proxies and everything. We can actually see if anybody's adding any additional headers or anything else to either our requests or our responses. So it's also used in terms of debugging, right? And when you're debugging, you maybe don't want the whole page back, right? Because bandwidth was expensive then. So you just want part of it. Um, Older ones, options, delete, trace. So this was an interesting one. Basically, give me back everything that I sent you as the body of the response. So this was another debugging thing where you would send a method of trace, blah, 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 blah all the headers, and then what you get back is a response with your, what the server saw as your request as the body, right? So this is another case where 
we're trying to debug from a server's perspective, right? So this is when you have client server architectures. You don't know if there's something else in between that's messing with your content. So maybe the server is seeing something different than what you're sending. Um, so this was a way to do that. I believe it's not used at all. Uh, I will say it actually enables vulnerabilities, so it's been completely eliminated. Um, you're just kind of, you know, if something's messing with your stuff, you use something encrypted. Uh, connect is used with proxies, so you're telling a proxy you want to connect to something else. And you can extend it with more. So important ones um, that a get is not supposed to change the state of the server. Actually, we'll get to this in a second. <coughs> but, so simple example, so here's a get slash, um, this was made during curl to google.com, so we have the start line, which is the method, a space, the path, uh, with the query, so the parts of the URI, a space, and then HTTP slash 1.1, so this is the protocol that we're speaking. Uh, we have user agent, so this is where the client tells the server what it is. Um, host www.google.com, except is another header that does other things that tells the server what kind of things it accepts in response. Why do we need this www.google.com? What's a shared host? Right, so first it seems counterintuitive. It's like the server, does, does google.com not know it's google.com? Right, because we have in our URI google.com, we made a DNS lookup, and we go to google.com. And in fact, back in the days when uh, the web was first invented, they didn't have this host header. Now the problem is, now you can only run one website for one domain on one server. And as we search, I mean, this is a good, the idea is you want one server to be able to host multiple websites or multiple domains. So this is called uh, usually virtual hosts, uh, depending on your web server. So the idea is the IP address, obviously the server knows its IP address, but in this way it can give different content depending on what host the uh, URI is for. So, uh, so yep, all the important things. And modern requests, though, look very complicated, so this is a, uh, I pulled this from Safari of a request it made to Google. Um, there's accept encoding, I believe tells the server that it will accept like uh, deflate or gzip content back and it will transparently do that and handle that. It also prefers text HTML or application HTML, these are all MIME types of different data types that it supports. It tells it something super weird that it's Mozilla 5.0. I actually can't remember off the top of my head why, but if you look, almost every browser says this in the first part of the user agent string, and then later clarifies what exactly it is. Is it, this is a Macintosh, an Intel Mac OS X X1010, which is kind of crazy. I don't know if you've ever looked at this, but you're, you're sending this to every single website you visit. Right, so every single website knows exactly that I'm browsing from a Mac and I'm running Safari. Oh yeah, sorry, I even stopped because I thought surely the user agent can't be that long. Um, it's actually showing me that it's Apple WebKit. Is so WebKit is the core browsing and the core HTML engine. Um, I don't know why it says Chrome and Safari here. I don't know. User agents are a whole crazy, complicated mess. Uh, <coughs> So, and then, so this is the request, right? So the, server, the client makes a request, and now the server needs to decide how to respond. So what are some of the ways? So put yourself in, the, in terms of a server, right? If you're an HTTP server, what are some responses that, how many do you want to respond? So I come up to you and I say, I would like resource X, please. 404? Yeah, 200, okay. Yeah, so you may be able to say like, okay, yes, here is X. You may need to say, I have no idea of what you're talking about. I've never heard of an X. What else? What? Yeah, you may say like, oh, sorry, I tried to fetch X and I exploded, so good luck. <laughs> what else? 
You're not allowed. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you can't access X. <laughs> what else? Yeah, I may tell you that actually X is over there, right? Somebody else actually has X. And I may want to tell you that, ah, just for right now, somebody else has X, or so X is at some other resource. Or I might want to tell you, don't ever ask me again for X, it's somewhere completely different, right? And so there's actually this rich vocabulary that a server needs, needs to have to communicate properly to a client about the status of the request. Um, there's even a way for a server to say, I'm still working on it. I'm still working on it. And then actually reply. Um, but the response, and this is also something, again, that you've already created, looks very similar to a request. So you're going to say the protocol number. Uh, again, remember this is important. A, a status code and a short reason for that status code, followed by headers, followed by a body. So again, the syntax is very similar. Your status line, headers, body, everything separated by CRLF, and empty line, the overall structure is almost exactly the same. The difference is, um, <coughs> now the response codes are usually, not usually, uh, response codes are three digit codes where the first most digit, they're separated into categories based on the first most digit. So you have the 100s, which are the uh, okay, yes, I got your request. I'm continuing to work on it. Uh, 200s, which say, like, it was accepted un and understood. 300s are all the redirect requests to say, go somewhere else. 400 means you messed up. Like, I couldn't parse your response or what you told me was garbage or you're not authorized. The default's on you. 500 is I messed up. The server blew up or, I don't know, something happened. Like, sorry. Uh, so you have some of the interesting ones. When you look through these, they're kind of fun. Uh, you see some of these. So 200 is pretty much the most standard. Yes, everything went well. Uh, created, accepted, no content. 301 moved permanently. So this means like literally never ask for this resource again and you can cache this result. Like always go somewhere else. 307 is a temporary redirect. 400 means you made a bad request. 401 means you're not authorized. 403 means you're forbidden. I don't know what the difference is there. Maybe you, you could be authorized, but I don't know. Uh, 404 is not found. 500 is internal server error. 501 means like it's not implemented. I think that would be if you made a weird uh, method that if the server didn't understand. Like if you put foobar as the method, and I'm like, I don't know what foobar this resource means. Uh, bad gateway, service unavailable, all kinds of stuff. So. Yeah, it's kind of funny that like 404 has entered like the common nomenclature, right? Because normal people see this when they browse, and so they actually know what that means. Uh, <coughs> all right, so uh, example of a re so we have our example request from before. This is from the curl, and then we have the corresponding response back. So we can see it actually includes a lot more information than was previously sent. So we first have the status line, which is HTTP slash 1.1, um, 200 OK. So we know this is a good response. Then every line is separated by CRLF. We have a date. We have when does this expire? We have different things of cache control of who can cache it and when they can cache it. And this is a lot of what the RFC, as you probably look through it, is dealing with, is what exactly the semantics are for every single one of these headers. Um, we have set cookies, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, X, XSS protection, X frame options. Um, this alternative protocol is interesting because this is what the server is using to tell the client that it actually supports uh, SPDY or HTTP 2.0. Um, so they, on the next request, it can try it if it needs, if it wants to. Um, the transfer encoding chunked. You guys had to deal with that, right? It wouldn't have tested. To add more tests in there. Yeah, that's a fun one. Uh, yeah, how you transfer it and when you transfer it. Uh, those are all interesting things. And then the new line, and then finally you have the body, which is going to be the HTML as we finally get there. So one of the interesting things about the web in general is how do you add new things to this protocol? 
So like how did HVP go from HVP 1.0 to HVP 1.1? Looks like they didn't hit it. I mean part of it is so they they said that you had to add the host editor, right? I mean, and yes, to officially update the spec you have to go through the whole process, but how would you prove that it actually works? <laughs> or what if you're running a browser or a web server and you want to test some new feature? So there's actually a nice aspect about the web in that, so all of those headers that start with x dash, those are experimental. So the x dash, yeah, stands for, I believe, experimental. And it means that if you don't know what it is, just ignore it. And actually that's a common uh, policy, I don't know if that's the right term, but a common way of writing web servers and web browsers is if you don't really understand what something means, just ignore it. You assume like you don't support it, it's fine, but you leave it or you don't uh, mess with it. And this is how the web evolves. So you don't need somebody's permission to change your browser to send a different header. Right? And then once you prove that it's a good idea, then it gets adopted into standardization. So it's actually the web is this kind of, they call it like a, it's like a living, breathing ecosystem. Like somebody, probably in the Netscape area, thought it was awesome to create an HTML blink tag that was like blink and flash. Have you ever seen that? Maybe not because it's been deprecated. For, <laughs> and actually it's been removed from modern web browsers. <laughs> uh, but it got added at some point and it got added to a spec because people used it. Yeah, you have this, and especially with the web, you have this interesting mix between, and we'll see servers like web developers and website operators, servers and clients. Because if you wanted to add some crazy cool tag to like, I don't know, move text around, right? You need a browser to support that. But browsers aren't gonna support that until more websites need it. You have this vicious circle. So if you can prove that it works and that it'd be useful, you can convince people to adopt it as part of the standards. Anyways. Okay, cool, we talked about all this. Yeah, so the content type is interesting. Actually, this is a good uh, point to look at. This tells the user agent, what am I looking at? What did you give me? Right? We know we can actually, even though it's called a hypertext transport protocol, right? The HT and the HTTP, <coughs> right? It doesn't mean that we browse the web. It doesn't mean you're always getting HTML pages back, right? You're often getting images or PDFs or whatever. And so that header tells the browser, what did you just send me? Which is important. And then the actual docs. Okay, cool. So now we're going to actually dig into a little bit of how HTTP does authentication. <coughs> so why would we need authentication? We have this awesome open document sharing system where we're linking like a universe of web links and documents. Why would we need authentication? Yeah, because we want to control our the access, right? It's kind of the whole idea of why we need security in the first place, right? It's like some documents we don't want to be available to everyone, right? Confidentiality, right? We want to restrict access to certain documents. Um, so HTTP actually has this built in to the protocol, which is why we're looking at it here. Um, basically, the server sends a 401 that says you are not authorized to view this content and include the challenge as well as some schema of how you should respond to that challenge. Um, and then the client must, if it wants to access it, can try again with a header that says auth authorization with whatever that response is. So we'll look at uh, HTTP basic authentication, which this is another thing that like, they clearly knew that they needed some kind of security in terms of restricting access to documents. We'll look at how they actually did it. So the server will say, hey, you need to authenticate with basic under the realm of reserved documents, which is there can be different realms for whatever you're doing. And the client retries the access, including a base64 encoded username and password. So how secure is base64 encoding? That's not encoding. I mean, it's not secure. It's not cryptographically secure. It's an encoding, which means you can decode it. Right? So all you have to do is take that string, put it into any base64 decoder, 
and it will show exactly what it is. And if we're talking about using HTTP, this data is getting sent from the client to the server over what protocols? HTTP over what? TCP and IP. Do any of those provide confidentiality or encryption? No, which means that, and this is why we study the network attacks, right? Which means anyone on the path from the client to the server can get the username and password. And not only that, if anyone on your local network who can make do any kind of art poisoning attack can force that traffic to come through them and manage the middle of your traffic. Yeah. So do you know, did they just assume that no one would ever be trying to snoop on each other, or did they assume that there was going to be security added around it like there is now today? That is a good question. I think I would believe that they weren't thinking really about security in the sense that they knew they needed some kind of access control mechanism and they said, hey, we should include that in the HTTP itself. There wasn't, at this point, a lot of security look at anything, really. So uh, most things were just like, can it work? And then it works, and then great, you move on to the next thing. And then somebody goes, wait a minute, you can, because at that point, it may not have even been common knowledge all these other attacks that we know on a local network. So it was probably like, oh yeah, I mean, you're trusted, the server's trusted, you trust your ISP, what, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> so try to crack this username password. You can do that. Um, HTTP 1.1 adds additional. So this is if you've ever hit a resource and it, the browser pops up a username password dialog, it's one of these mechanisms. So this is, it's not always basic, but it's definitely, um, so, at least in HTTP 1.1, and we didn't go over any crypto, so it's, you know, these are just high level concepts. The server sends some nonce, the client creates a hash of the username, the password, and the nonce value, the HTTP method, and the requested URL. Um, and then the server can rerun that calculation to check that those are the same. So, in this case, you're not leaking out your username and password to everyone. But the problem now is the web server has to have access to the clear text of your password in order to produce this same computation. So these, I, these reasons, plus the fact that the interface is really terrible when you go to a website that uses this HTTP authorization, right? Your browser's frozen until you put in this username and password box, that almost very few sites actually use this stuff. Um, so, which means now every website will see has to implement its own uh, user password authentication and authorization mechanisms. All right, cool. So, you can and you should uh, be sniffing and playing with and looking at HTTP traffic. So now modern browsers are really awesome at this. So you can open up uh, in any modern browser, there'll be some developer tab or developer tools which will have a sweet toolbar that will show you the text of the page, and then if you make a request, usually with that toolbar open, it will show you the network traffic of every single HTTP request your browser is making to render that page. Um, so that's a cool way to monitor even what you're doing. Um, we can use TCP dump or Wireshark to listen to all the HTTP traffic that we're making to look at what web, re what web requests we're making. Um, proxies, so proxies are super useful. So we can create a proxy and then we can tell our browser to, hey, send all my traffic through this local proxy and that way I can look at every single request that's getting sent out and all the responses. And not only that, I can actually monitor, uh, modify and change it. Um, so this is actually one of the best tools and the tool I always use when I'm doing web vulnerability analysis is I use a tool called Burp Proxy, which I think, yes, okay, good. Uh, so there's extensions you can do to modify your requests. Um, I use Burp Proxy to, and whenever I'm doing like a CTF or something, I do all of my requests through Burp Proxy, and that way I have history of everything, every request <coughs> I've made, and then I can, I sometimes modify that request, so sometimes you want to fuzz something and see the result in a browser. You can modify the request, Burp has, um, even, so it has a free version, so you should download it and use it. Um, it has, even the free version, the thing I use the most is, I think it's called Repeater. So 
So you can get a raw HTTP request of one that you proxy, and then you can edit and change various fields. So you can be like, what happens if I change this parameter to this? Hit go, it makes the request, shows you the response to another frame. You can keep changing, trying things, going backwards and forward through the request that you made. Uh, it has things like it can URL decode things, it can URL encode things with the percent encoding, it can percent encode as you type. Anyways, it's a nice tool. It's a little bit scary, so uh, maybe I'll do a demo at some point. But it is a professional grade tool that's used by real pen testers. And you don't even need the like the paid version. I think it's probably three hundred dollar, four hundred dollars last I checked. And it, it does some definitely some cool stuff, but not this, nothing you desperately need. Cool. All right. Are we going to do it? Yes, we are. Wow. All right. So finally, we get to everything. We get to the H in HTTP. We get to now the hypertext markup language. So how many people are familiar with HTML? Good. OK. This should be, uh, yeah, it's always good when you talk to somebody and say they can program. They can do HTML. <laughs> <laughs> it's a language. It's a language. Um, so the idea is we want some format for Tim Berners-Lee, Sir Tim Berners-Lee created this in his, in his mind, that you wanted this format to be able to create documents that are portable, right? You don't want this reliance on something like a PDF, which is reliant on Adobe Reader to read and render properly. And so it was based on SGML, so he didn't actually invent this syntax 100%. Um, so the history here is HTML 2.0 was in 95, 3.2 was in 97, 4.01 was in 99, so you can see there's a lot of progress, a lot of things going on. And then XML 1.0 was announced, so actually, so, okay, we have hands for XML, what, or HTML, what about XML? Anybody ever use XML? Yeah, so XML actually came from HTML, which was super interesting. So just like URIs was this idea of how to generalize URLs to more things, XML said, hey, HTML is really useful, but there's some things that are not quite standard. Let's fix that, generalize it. You can describe documents that describe what uh, a schema that defines what H XML is valid for whatever your purposes are. And the web wholeheartedly rejected that. So it wasn't until <laughs> literally there was no progress made in like HTML, I mean, no official progress from like 2000 to 2014. So there was this whole thing of like, you know, rewriting your, your web page so that it would be XHTML compliance, and it ended up being super dumb. And it was too much work, and there was too much momentum behind HTML itself. So that's why we finally got HTML 5.0, which uh, said, you know what, it's fine. Not everything needs to be XML. And so the cool thing is right now, like I mentioned briefly, uh, HTML spec is what's called a, like a living document. So it's continually being evolved, and you can go check out kind of the latest spec and the latest uh, thing of what's going on. Uh, so you can write uh, HTML. Now the problem is, so think about this from a browser's perspective, right? So you're a user agent, you're a browser, you're rendering HTML content for a user. You go to some site that was written in 1996. So what's the most, like, highest language of HTML that you could use? HTML 2.0. So what are you gonna do? <coughs> are you gonna tell your browser, your user, sorry, old website you're trying to visit, I'm not going to render that. What do you do? Okay, you'll do your best to try to render it, right? That's, so you may, you know, when you think about this is why, part of the reason why browsers are some of the most complex software you have on your devices, right? Because they're and this is why there's so many vulnerabilities. We've seen that with uh, the binary analysis you've been looking at, right? Is you have an application, here you have a C++ application that not only has to render and display and have a GUI and parse this HTML language, but it has to support every possible version because you 
you don't know what kind of garbage you're going to get from that server. And if you refuse to render content because as we'll see, let's say you forget an ending tag, right? So you say, oh, too bad, like that page sucks, I'm not going to render it, right? Somebody else, like your users are going to use a different browser because your tool sucks, right? If I can't get to your website, it's, nobody blames the website, they blame Chrome or Firefox or Internet Explorer. So, so you have to not only support all of the standards, but all of the literal, I mean like, Look at some old web pages, it's literal garbage, it makes almost no sense, but it still kind of works. And so you still have to be backwards compatible with websites written in 1995 or 1994. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, web browsers, like why do they work? So the basic idea, so rather than the idea I proposed earlier of separating out, here's where the links are and where they link to, and here's the HTML, uh, here's the text. The idea is you mark up the page with tags which try to add semantic meaning to the raw text. So a start tag is going to start with a less than symbol. Yes. Um, the name of the tag, in this case, would be foo, and then a closing, a uh, greater than symbol. Pretty easy, right? So followed by some text. So now you've got whatever text you want. And then ending with an end tag, which is the same thing as a start tag, but with a slash. So you have this less than symbol, a slash, foo, and then a greater than symbol. It's pretty simple. And that's it. This is all this is based off of. And you can have a self-closing tag, which means, so this is actually syntactic sugar that corresponds to a start tag and an end tag right after each other. So you can have something like this which is a less than symbol, bar, space, slash, greater than symbol. Bar, not the bar symbol, but B-A-R, just as a, the element name. And you can have void tags. So you have tags that have no ending tag. So for, so for something like an image, an IMG tag, you have a less than symbol, IMG, and then a greater than symbol. And this is the big difference. So for people who are familiar with XML, every XML start tag has to be matched by an end tag. HTML is not, and people hated that. So, um, things like an image doesn't really make sense to have a closing tag because semantically, what does the text inside of an image tag mean? That's kind of a separate point. But So the idea is the tags are hierarchical, so you can nest tags within tags and tag and tags and tags and tags and tags all the way down. Um, yeah, you can't break them though to have a start tag followed by a closing tag for each element before you, yeah, so you can't have overlapping nesting, that doesn't make sense. And it makes more sense when you think of them, they're hierarchical, so they form a tree structure. So for instance, here we can have a major document with a start HTML and end HTML tag, a head tag, so a start head tag and end head tag, a start title tag and an end title tag with the text in it of example, a body tag, and then inside that P tag, which stands for paragraph, says I am the example text. So the cool thing is this forms a tree structure, if you think, if you kind of tilt it a little bit and think about it, where the root is HTML, HTML has two children, head and body, head has a child title, and title has a child of text of example, and body has a child of a P tag with text I am the example text. So it looks roughly like this if you look at it in a tree structure. Cool. But this is not enough. How do we know what image we want to put? Right? We have an I and G tag, but we need. So we need to add attributes to these tags. So we don't just want to have the tags themselves or links. How do we specify links with something like this, right? We can create a tag called an anchor, which gives links, but we need to provide what's the URI that I go fetch when you click this link. So this is with attributes inside of tags. So the idea is that attributes live inside the tags in between the less than symbol and the greater than symbol. Uh, and the tricky thing is there's four different types of syntax here. Yeah. So you can have an attribute bar and a tag foo. So it's just separated by spaces on its own, nothing else. So this means that the tag foo has the attribute bar. 
You can have foo and then inside there you can have the bar equals baz, which means the tag foo or the element foo has an attribute of bar which is has the value of baz. And then you can single quote baz, the, the attribute there, or you can double quote it. So these are four different things. The first one is different because this only says that the element foo has an attribute bar. So you can think of it as a binary. It's either there or it's not, but it has no value. The other way is separated by values. And then you separate multiple attributes with spaces. And you can get very complicated things here to add semantic meaning to the tags. Which now gets us to finally complete the loop and say, how do we do hyperlinks? We, why do we need hyperlinks? So we can get URIs to other documents that we can make HTTP requests to get new HTML pages, which contain new hyperlinks. So it's an anchor tag. So it's a lowercase a, a for anchor. Oh, also there's, uh, HTML is not case sensitive. So you can use uppercase or lowercase or a combination of both. Don't be a monster, use lowercase. <laughs> the href attribute, which is, sounds like a really weird thing, but hypertext reference, that's the href comes from, is used to provide the URI, and the text inside that anchor tag is the text of the hyperlink. So that's what gets underlined and put in blue. So it's all starting to now come together. So we can have an anchor tag with an href of http colon slash slash google.com, text of example, and that will look like a classic link that we're all uh, super happy about. Um, a basic, so this is the basic structure of an HTML5 page. Um, we first had this thing with a less than symbol, a uh, exclamation point, and then a doc type HTML. I can't remember if that doc type is a special element or if it, I'm trying to remember if the exclamation point means anything. It's not an HTML comment, that's something different, but. I think that's to specify if it's HTML uh, 5.0. Yes, this is definitely necessary to tell the browser it's an HTML5 web page. I'm trying to think of technically if that's an attribute or I mean, if that's an element called doc type or what it means. Yeah, language. exactly. I think it's, but it's definitely necessary to say this is an HTML5 page. Then you need your HTML tags, you need a head, you need a meta tag in the head that tells the browser what character set. Are you UTF-8 characters? Is it ASCII? Is it all of these other types of characters? So you think about this is a, a way for the browser, the client to tell the browser this is how to parse what I'm sending you. Some title, a body, and an href. <laughs> so, so all, all, actually, everything is needed here except for this, eight, this anchor tag in, in the body. So you need the doc type, you need the HTML, head, meta, title, and a body to be a compliant HTML5 page. And you can easily find this stuff online of how to do this. All right, then we get to the browser. So the user agent is the main term, is responsible for parsing, interpreting the HTML, and displaying it to the user. Um, why is this important to have this distinction between browsers and user agents? Yeah, user agent, you think of it like it's acting on behalf of the user. So it doesn't mean you're, I mean, browsing is a very specific connotation. It could be, the user agent could be curl, like I had, so I'm looking for just the output in my terminal. It could be, we could be using links or another type of non-GUI web browser. Uh, we may be using, I sometimes use W3M and Emacs to look up documentation in a window in Emacs. So it formats it differently. Like a REST API would be those two. Examples. A REST API, yeah, that could be a different, uh, different one. So yeah, it's just, um, but we're very familiar with these. So you can, so this is an example of that example page in Chrome and then also in the links web browser. So you can actually use this and mess with that. Um, now the question is, so what are the special characters in HTML? Yeah, so less than symbols, greater than symbols, right? Um, slashes, spaces sometimes, double quotes, depending on if you're inside an attribute or not. Right, so single quote, double quote, as we'll see, ampersands, also equal signs, because our attributes are foo equals bar. 
Again, now we have this problem. How do we include this? If I want to create a, let's say, a, uh, some text that says five is less than 10, right, some math equation, how does the browser know that that less than symbol is text that I want to be displayed and not the start of a new tag? Or how do I put text that says, here's how you create a basic HTML page, right, and the start tag of, of HTML? Yeah. We need some like tag encoding. Could we use percent encoding? Yeah, we could. That would make sense, but no, we don't. I think probably, I would guess, I have to look into it historically, but I think it's because of the fact that HTML was based on SGML, which probably already had this encoding, is my guess, now that I think about it more. Because, yeah, like having these two different encodings and all these different things causes a ton of problems, as we'll find out. So it's called HTML, you'll, you'll find actually a lot of names for this. It's called the entity reference or entity encoding in the HTML5 spec. You'll see um, character encoding. The idea is everything, so the ampersand is now going to be our special character that says, and there's three different types of syntax here, which is crazy. So you have a named character reference, you have ampersand, some predefined name, and a semicolon. So this is how all entities are encoded like this that are things that you want to be shown as text. You can have a decimal character reference, so you can have ampersand, a hash symbol, and then the decimal, so not hex, but the base 10 Unicode code point of what you want. And you can have hexadecimal, so you can have ampersand, hash, x, and then a hexadecimal Unicode code point. Um, it's a cause of a lot of different vulnerabilities that we'll find out, so it's really key to understand this encoding. Uh, some examples, obviously ampersand needs to be encoded if we want to use this, right? So we have to do, we can encode it three different ways. We have the ampersand <coughs> symbol, AMP semicolon, so this would encode it as an ampersand. We can do ampersand hash 38, which is the decimal point of ampersand, or we can do ampersand pound x26. Uh, and we can even put zeros in front of the hex encoding, all kinds of cra crazy stuff. The, cra the E with the accent above my, on my last name, it's like E acute or any of these three ones. So we talked about why we need to encode less than symbols, right? It's actually incredibly important, otherwise the browser may think we're trying to start a new tag, right? But we don't want to start a tag, we want to show text to the user. So it has to be, you'll see ampersand LT semicolon in a lot of pages when they're using this. Um, okay, so when we get back, we probably got so close, uh, we have a little bit more to do here. We're going to talk about how to give input to a web application, which is going to be how we get our input in and trigger vulnerabilities.